For many walk that are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Words taken from the lesson for this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I have an old novena prayer book put out by the sister or doors of the precious blood. In this book is found an appeal that expresses the grief of his majesty over the lack of cooperation found among men. It was carved by an unknown sculptor into the walls of an old European cathedral. And it goes like this. Thou callest me master, yet heedest not me. Thou callest me light, yet I shine not in thee. Thou callest me way, but dost follow me not. Thou callest me life, yet my name is for God. Thou callest me truth, but playest a false role. Thou callest me guide, yet despisest control. Thou callest me loving, withholding thy heart. Thou callest me rich, yet desirest no part. Thou callest me good, and yet evil thy ways. Thou callest me eternal, while wasting thy days. Thou callest me noble, yet draggest me down. Thou callest me mighty, not fearing my frown. Thou callest me just, oh, if just then I be. When I shall condemn thee, reproach thou not me. Now, in regards to the last line, as sobering as it is, the condemnation can apply to both the eternal prison of hell and the temporary prison of purgatory. Both of them should be undesirable to us, obviously. But today, let's go through this appeal line by line in order to motivate ourselves to grow in virtue and to find ways to relieve the grief of our Savior who has sacrificed everything for us. So many promises he's given in return as well for our fidelity. So, thou callest me master, yet heedest not thou me. What are masters but those who not only know the hard lessons of their trade, but are very capable of passing them along to others by word and by deed, by example. To heed not the counsels and admonitions of a master is to invite inevitable failure. His majesty is the master of masters, knowing all that is needed to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, all that is needed to gain eternal life, as we heard in the lesson. And he has given us a priceless example to follow. What do we do? We follow reluctantly, thinking we can make it by some other middle way, perhaps. Not so hard and trying. Perhaps we are willing to follow when we are around faithful Catholics of like mind and like heart. But when we're alone or among neo-pagan world around us, hmm... We give way. We forget his counsels. We forget his commands and his admonitions. And we let them quickly fall away. In our time, not a few even laugh at them. As we heard in the gospel. So is his majesty truly our master? Thou callest me master, yet heedest not thou me. The second line, thou callest me light, yet I shine not in thee. In the Sermon on the Mount, his majesty commands us to be the light of the world, even to let our light shine. What light is this that he speaks of? It's the light of grace. It's the light of virtue. When you're virtuous, you shine. Fancy word for it. Nitor, 
St. Thomas speaks of that. When we sin, we stain that nitor, that shine that we're meant to have. Saints glowed. When we're virtuous, we begin to glow. And also this light is the light of faith shining in our minds. Man instinctively longs to see some example of virtue and goodness. We love it when we see it. Man admires those who hold to their belief without fail. And yet we, knowing the truth as we do, often readily allow error to propagate in our presence. We watch some program where the faith is attacked or even laughed at. More and more common, isn't it? Is this not putting a shade on our light? Let us remember that when the truth is spoken, a grace is always there. It's always present. Others may not like what we say or do, but they recognize it. They recognize it. It is right. And they often admire us for saying it or doing what they're too weak to say or to do. They're also less likely to speak of error before us again, but rather seek us quietly when they want to know the answer to some difficult or troubling thing. Thou callest me light, yet I shine not in thee. Thou callest me way, but dost not follow me. As mentioned above, masters are not only good teachers, but they lead by example. His majesty is not only one example, but the example. He is the way itself. He has no peer. Only he can go vertical, go up. All others, Buddha, Luther, Krishna, Muhammad, they're all dead ends. Not true masters. They're dead and rotting bones, they are. If you want to go vertical, if you want to go to heaven, this is the only way. When I am lifted up, I will draw all things to myself, says the Lord. And here we do not want to follow. We don't want to be lifted up too hard, too strict, too hard, too rigid. Almost everyone wants a break, some mitigation, less fasting, fewer prayers, shorter mass, more casual wear, off with the mountain climbing gear, more entertainment. Thou callest me way, but dost not follow me. Thou callest me life, yet my name is forgot. It seems most men have forgotten how to invoke well the holy name of God and our Savior, His Majesty Jesus Christ. Instead, at best, they use it haphazardly, don't they? Frivolously, in passing, without due respect and love owed to the name of God. At worst, they blaspheme the holy name. Thus, we have the holy face devotions and the divine praises to make reparation. Do we bow our heads at the holy name? Do we seek to make reparation for its misuse? Do we correct those who misuse it in our presence when able? May we never forget the holy name of Jesus that saves us from losing our souls. May we not cease invoking God's holy name in a fruitful way and cease invoking it in a casual way. Let us cease invoking God's name in a casual manner. Thou callest me life, yet my name is for God. Thou callest me truth, but playest a false role. The world is filled with false role-playing. It has become a fantasy world, hasn't it? On the flight over to Europe and the flight home and now those little private TV things in front of you, it's amazing how many people are all carried away with some fantasy film. Once my grandfather, my sister and I, 
were watching at my grandfather's house, we decided to watch a Star Wars film. This is many, many years ago. My grandfather said, after it was over with, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. What a complete waste of time. That was the last movie I ever watched. He was right. That what a stupid thing they just put together. These things are stupid. Why are we wasting our time? They're filled with fantasy and false role playing. Hollywood and the news media are the masters of men now. And they present regularly both statements and models of falsity. How often do we pretend to like something of the world in order to be agreeable on some matter that we ought not agree about? We do this in order just to get along and not cause problems or perhaps for some personal gain. Seems clear to me that many high up in the church, sad to say, and those high up in the world are playing a false role for the sake of a false unity. An empty and short-lived political peace, as did the Pharisees and the Herodians unite against his majesty, and later Pilate and Herod. St. Benedict says in his holy rule, to n make not a false peace. Do we try to placate, to get along and avoid conflicts? Thou callest me truth, but playest a false role. Thou callest me guide, yet despisest control. Now, it's clear to me that one of the most damaging plagues resulting from the abuse of authority in our time, the abuse of power, is the unwillingness to be led found in so many people. It is a terrible plague because we cannot go up the mountain alone. We need a guide. We need a Moses. We must be part of the church. We're saved in a body. This is clearly shown in the third secret of Fatima. In the second description of those climbing the mountain with the Holy Father leading, all is in proper order. Bishops and priests and religious and lay faithful of different ranks, all climbing as a body and dying together as a body. It's awesome. And they do it for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. This is how God works. Yet sad to say, how many today being disgusted with our leaders? And let's face it, there's reason to be disgusted. Attempt to lead themselves or even lead the leaders. Falling into a communistic trap of despising to be led. How very dangerous are these times. It is as if everyone is fighting a personal war of independence with God. They know it is a losing battle, but want some settlement. Can I not just, and then fill in the blank of what they want. Let us be willing to be led. Nay, let us even look for opportunities to be led, lest we fall into the trap and contract the plague. Thou callest me guide yet despises control. Thou callest me loving with withholding thy heart. Cold hearts are selfish hearts. Living for themselves, selfish, self-confident, self-assured. It is part of the wrath of God that he lets everyone go their own way. That's what's happening now. He lets men seek themselves and their own ends. Charity grows cold. As Our Lady of Good Success complained to Venerable Mother Mariana, when the church is most in need of assistance to fight off the evils of this time, few there are who are willing to help. Due to the scandals of this moment, many are not willing to repair and build up the church. Thus, it's only going to get worse. And they will hold their hearts. Thou callest me loving, withholding thy heart. 
Thou callest me rich, yet desirest no part. The riches of Christ are found in a sacred heart. Here we find the treasures of grace, of truth, of mercy, of virtue, of good and right. This divine treasure chest has been revealed to us and it's opened. It's been pierced by a lance, pierced for our offenses, that we might receive everything we need to be forgiven and to climb anew up the mountain, to go vertical. Yet we prefer to find some natural solution to our problems, some program. There's a tendency today to pathologize everything and exculpate ourselves and seek entitlement. Anything but the cross. We receive from the sacred heart at each Holy Communion. We receive the sacred heart, the treasures. We do not ask well for the graces we need, lest they be given in the shape of a cross. This is the problem. We're afraid of it. Yes, we ask for help to solve our problems, but when the answer is given, we tend to run away and try something else. How many run away? Thou callest me rich, yet desirest no part. Thou callest me good, and yet evil thy ways. We admit that God is good and the saints are good, but we despair of being good ourselves. It's too hard, not human, not normal to live like that. We say to others in so many ways, get used to it. That's how I am. Thou callest me good, and yet evil thy ways. Thou callest me eternal while wasting thy days. St. Paul admonishes us to redeem the time. Saints made vows to waste not a minute. Many a saint hardly slept in seeking to do good. They were never bored. In St. Peter's Basilica, the sculpture, one of the most striking of all the sculptures inside of the beautiful basilica, is at the tomb of Alexander VII the first to speak almost dogmatically on the Immaculate Conception. Alexander II, his tomb is right over the door that goes down into the crypt of St. Peter's. And there's a skeleton coming out of that door with an hourglass in his hand. The skeleton is blindfolded. It's truly an amazing sculpture. What's the meaning? We never know When our time will be up with the grim reaper, death coming for us. Are we ready? Have we spent our time well? Some take consolation in the fact that there's always purgatory to finish the job. But just think. The good Lord gives us in this life everything we need to avoid going to that most painful prison in the next. How many waste their days before some gaming device or some electronic gadget or some other useless distraction? Thou callest me eternal while wasting thy days. Thou callest me noble, yet draggest me down. In our times, we have made His Majesty, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, anything but majestic. Instead, He is portrayed in art and spoken of as a sort of chummy friend or even someone like us near to despair. So many of the crucifixes of our time, the modern crucifixes, show a man who seems to have lost the battle, all saggy and out of sorts instead of the majestic crucifixes of old, showing the victory in the midst of the greatest of all trials. How many times do we drag down His majesty by saying something like, oh, well, God, He'll understand. These deplorable images and unfitting sayings are not proper of the infinite nobility of God. 
Thou callest me noble, yet draggest me down. Thou callest me mighty, not fearing my frown. Fear of God seems to be something forgotten and forbidden to discuss today. Instead, all we seem to hear about is God's mercy. Yet we know from Our Lady and her Magnificat that God's mercy is granted to those who fear Him. That's where it comes from. Fear must precede mercy. How can we expect the power of God to work in our life, the church and the world, unless we first of all fear Him and put Him first in every way and follow His laws and His counsels? Thou callest me mighty, not fearing my frown. Thou callest me just, oh, if just then I be, when I shall condemn thee, reproach thou not me. In the end, we will have no excuse. Souls who have returned from their judgments often say they were reduced to silence before his majesty, unable to make any defense for themselves. And so it will be with us too. Let us then take this appeal carved into the walls of a cathedral to heart. Paste it in our prayer books. Put it on our refrigerator doors, on the bathroom mirror. Lest we too be condemned by the just judge who offered us so much time, so many riches, and so much mercy in this life as being the way, the truth, and the life himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 